we want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. So it's a very special uh, welcome to Wilmer Hutchins, even though I went to school in Lancaster, that was kind of hard to say, but no, we do certainly welcome you. Appreciate the fact that you joined us today. Um, teachers, if you're watching, you have signed up, please go to www.tiny.cc slash high school restoration. Sign up for us, please. Program today will be taxonomy. During this virtual field trip, students will recognize the importance of a standardized taxonomic system for the scientific community, learn to categorize organisms using hierarchical classification system based on similarities and differences shared among groups and compare characteristics of taxonomic groups. Uh, Mr. Monroe will do a program called Introduction to Taxonomy. Ms. Ramirez, archaea and bacteria. Ms. Ram, protease and fungi. Mr. Dominguez, plants and animals. Uh, students, during this program, you cannot ask us a verbal question, but you can write down your question and send it to www.tiny.cc slash question dash answer and send it to us. We would appreciate it that and we'll send the answer back to you. Now I am going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Monroe is going to tell you all about taxonomy. Good afternoon, students. My name is Mr. Monroe and we're going to be looking in to that method of classifying and grouping organisms that we call taxonomy. Now, I guess, the best way for me to start my presentation is to let you know there are a couple of things that I want you to remember, hopefully by the end of my presentation and you get ready to go into the other parts of your virtual field trip with us today. First of all, I want you to be able to remember and recognize the eight major levels of taxonomy. And then as I go through my presentation, there is a man's name that is going to be very important for you to remember because he's famous for giving us the methods that we classify or categorize living organisms even today, even though he lived many, many years ago. So I'm gonna start a short PowerPoint. At the end of that short, that short PowerPoint, I've got one of my animal friends from the lab here. I'm gonna walk through how it falls into some of the levels of organization in taxonomy. And hopefully by that time, you will get a basic understanding of taxonomy and why it's important. So let me share my screen with you and we'll get started. Classification and taxonomy. You know, the essential question is, why is it important to place living things in categories? Well, you know what? Years ago, when we were trying to teach classification of animals or living things, I had a little activity that I would do with students by simply, I had a jar, having a jar that was full of nails, screws, washers, all kinds of little tidbits but you couldn't really see what was in that jar. And I would walk around to the students and I would ask them to observe the jar just for a few minutes, and then I would leave. And then I would come back and say, do you remember what you saw in that jar? And of course they named some well-known things that they knew about like screws and nails and, and washers. But it wasn't until I allowed them to pour everything out on the table and put those things that were in that jar in group according to the way they were alike. And that's when they realized, wow, there was a lot more in that jar than we really remember. And so that's one reason that categorizing, placing living things in categories helped scientists to learn a little bit more about the living things that live around us and how they're alike and how they're different. You know, scientists classify living things in order to organize and make sense of all this incredible life that our diversity of life that we have on the planet Earth. 
Now, taxonomy is the branch of biology that names and groups organisms according to their characteristics and evolutionary history. Organisms were first classified more than 2,000 years ago by a Greek philosopher by the name of Aristotle. And of course, Aristotle was very limited on what he could group and classify or categorize. And he used a simple way. I wish I had time to go over it with you, but it was very simple. And in some instances, it didn't really work, okay? Organisms were grouped into what we call three major groups, land dwellers, water dwellers, and air dwellers. And that's where they spent most of their lives. And this was Aristotle's way of doing it. And plants were placed into three categories based on the differences in their stems, even how tall they grew, if I remember right. A new organism, as new organisms were discovered, his system became inadequate. Categories were not specific enough. Common names did not describe a species accurately. It didn't describe the species accurately. Names were long and hard to remember. For example, ringworm. You know, ringworm is not a, a worm. It is a fungus. The circular rash in, is from exposure to the fungus, okay? And it's contagious among cats, dogs, cows, and persons that has it. You know, common names did not describe a species accurately. Names were long and hard again to remember. Along came, wow, a Swedish biologist by the name of Carlos, Carlos Linnaeus. And this happened in the mid 1700s. Boy, that was a long time ago. And he established a simple system for classifying and naming organisms. He developed a hierarchy, a ranking system for classifying organisms that is based on modern taxonomy, uh, taxonomy today. For this reason, he is considered the father of modern taxonomy. Linnaeus used an organism's morphology, that means its form, how it was shaped, and its structure to categorize it. His system is still being used today. His system allowed organisms to be grouped with similar organisms. He first divided all organisms into two kingdoms, plantae and animalia, meaning the animals. This was the same as Aristotle's main categories. The modern system, you know, each kingdom, plant and animal was divided into five divisions of plants. The phylum into a smaller group, which is called class. Each class was divided into an order. Each order was divided into families or family. Each family was divided into genus, plural would be genera. Each genus was divided into species, the scientific name, okay? Now, remember, there's a saying that you can use to describe. King Philip came over for great soda. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Well, there's one more level that is left out, as you can see. And I want you to remember eight. Hey, above the kingdom is what we call the domain, okay? Now, listen, guys, I'm gonna stop sharing at this moment because I don't want to run out of time. And we're going to go back and look at this little animal that's going to help me get over the, the concept of taxonomy. One of my favorite insects I have in my lab here, and that is a best beetle. Now we have them here at the Post Oak Preserve. This one's moving kind of slow, not very active because it's been kind of cool in my room. And I hope you guys can see that. That is a best beetle. And I did a little research on this best beetle, looking up what kingdom or what domain, starting with what domain this little beetle belongs to. Now this best beetle has several different names. They can be called a patent leather beetle or a best beetle. Sometimes they are referred to as a Betsy bug, okay? Now we're gonna go over the different levels 
that this little guy falls into, okay? It starts out, the domain that he belongs to or that that organism belongs to actually, actually is eukarya, okay? That's the domain. Now, the kingdom that it belongs to, animal, okay? The phylum, arthropoda. The class, hexapoda or insecta, okay? The order is Coleoptera, okay? Now, family is Pasalidae, and its genius is Pasalus. Now, as far as the species, students, there's over 500 different species of that little organism that I just showed you. So hopefully you've got an idea about taxonomy. You're gonna be hearing some more about taxonomy as you go through the rest of your virtual field trip with us today. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions, I bet he can answer those for you. Hey, we do have a question. A uh, simple definition of taxonomy. Taxonomy is the science of naming, describing, and classifying organisms and includes all plants, animals, and microorganisms of the world. And now Ms. Ramirez is gonna tell you about archaea and bacteria. Hello, in the next few segments, we'll be learning about the different kingdoms. In this segment, we're going to be focusing on kingdom uh, bacteria and kingdom archaea. Now, before we start our slide presentation, I actually have an animal friend to show you, and she's going to help us learn about bacteria. And so if you look at your hands, you actually have bacteria all over your body and even inside your body. And not all bacteria is bad. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a very common animal friend. This is Pepper. She's a blue silky chicken. And I chose to show her because chickens and a lot of poultry are actually have a lot of bacteria on them, in particular salmonella. Uh, so most chickens, turkeys, ducks, and other birds carry some form of salmonella. And there's over 2,000 uh, different types of salmonella bacteria. Now to the birds, it's mostly, uh, it doesn't cause them any harm, but to people, some strains of, of salmonella can. You guys might be familiar with salmonella because you might hear it on food recalls on the news. Other ways to contract salmonella is through eggs, um, reptiles, uh, chickens, um, and other food products. So oftentimes uh, when you touch an animal or when you're messing with eggs and other food products, they always tell you guys to wash your hands. Uh, that's to prevent the spread of other bacteria like salmonella. Um, so this is Pepper. She's a blue silky chicken and she gets that name because she has ear patches that are bright blue. And if you guys were lucky enough to touch her, she is super soft like silk. Um, and according to the CDC, there's over 1 million infections of salmonella a year. And some of those common symptoms would be things um, like stomach aches, cramps, diarrhea. So it doesn't sound really fun. It's not a fun thing to have. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put our little chicken friend up and we'll take a look at some other examples of bacteria too. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. I do have a couple of uh, focus questions for you guys. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you guys will be able to answer these two questions. The first is you should be able to name at least two characteristics of organisms in kingdom Archaea and give an example of an organism in that kingdom. And then two, you should be able to name at least two characteristics of organisms in kingdom bacteria that should read and give an example of organisms in that kingdom. So in this presentation, we are gonna be focusing on kingdom Archaea bacteria and kingdom uh, U bacteria. So we're only focusing on those two kingdoms. Now, throughout the presentation, you're going to hear me say a lot of vocabulary words. So I want to make sure that you guys understand what those words mean. We're going to be differentiating between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Uh, so prokaryotes are simply organisms whose cells uh, have no nucleus and they have uh, no membrane bound organelles. So the organisms that we're studying in my segment, the bacteria and archaea bacteria, those guys are all gonna be prokaryotes. In the later segments, you guys are gonna be learning about the eukaryotes, which are organisms that do have um, a membrane 
and they do have membrane bound organelles and a nucleus. So just keep in mind for my segment, we're focusing on those prokaryotes. We're also gonna be differentiating between unicellular and multicellular organisms. So unicellular means exactly what it sounds like. Uni means one. So these are simple one-celled organisms. Multicellular means made of many cells. So those are gonna be your complex ones. For my segment, since we're learning about bacteria and archaeobacteria, those guys are all gonna be unicellular. So they're very simple organisms. Uh, the other next two vocabulary words are autotrophs versus heterotrophs. So autotrophs in elementary school, uh, you might've learned producers. So autotrophs are just the plants, the trees, the organisms that produce or make their own food via photosynthesis. On the other hand, we have heterotrophs, uh, which are our animals, the organisms that have to eat or consume other organisms for energy. Uh, so in elementary or middle school, you probably heard of consumers. So for our purposes, since we are talking about bacteria and archaea bacteria in my segment, those guys are going to be, some of them are actually autotrophs and some of them are actually heterotrophs. So uh, for my segment, those kingdoms, it might depend on the species. And then we're also going to be looking at differences in the cell wall. So keep those things in mind as we go through the presentation. So the first one we're going to look at is uh, domain archaea and specifically kingdom archaea bacteria. So these guys are unicellular. So they're tiny, they're made out of one cell, and they are prokaryotes. So that means they do not have a cell membrane, or sorry, they do not have a uh, nucleus, and they do not have membrane-bound organelles. Now, these guys are super interesting, because if you look at the slide, they live in some of the most extreme environments. So some of them can be found in volcanic hot springs, uh, super salty brine pools, uh, they can be found in what's called black mud, where there's essentially no oxygen. Um, so these guys can live in extreme environments. Um, something interesting about these guys is their cell walls. Uh, they, lacked, they lack peptidoglycan, and their cell membranes contain very unusual lipids that are not found in other organisms. Uh, so these are very almost like an ancient type of organism. And you can see some examples here. We have thermophiles, which means these are uh, heat lovers. We have uh, sicrophiles, which are cold lovers. Acidophiles, which mean they thrive in, in acidic environments. We have the haliophiles, which thrive in super salty environments. And then we have the methanogens, uh, which survive uh, in environments with a lot of methane. So that's uh, kingdom archaeobacteria. Again, they're unicellular, and depending upon the kind, these guys might be autotrophic or heterotrophic. Moving on to domain bacteria, and this is kingdom eubacteria. These guys are unicellular and prokaryotic. Their cells have thick, rigid walls that surround a cell membrane, and the cell walls of this kingdom um, is actually made out of peptidoglycan. And some of these guys uh, photosynthesize, so some of them are autotrophic, and then others are heterotrophic. So again, it depends on the kind. And then one of the most famous examples of an organism in this kingdom is Yersinia pestis. And this is one of my favorite ones. So Yersinia pestis is actually a, a gram-negative bacteria that was responsible for the bubonic plague. Uh, so if you guys are love history of diseases. Uh, this is an interesting one for you guys to research. Um, so by 1347, Paris had lost over 50,000 people. So that's one third of its population. And they had so many people that had died from the plague that they had to start transporting the bodies into underground cemeteries. And so here's a picture of the catacombs in Paris. And you can see all those bones and skeletons. Uh, so many of the people that were uh, taken to those underground cemeteries, unfortunately died from the plague. And I had an opportunity to go there a couple of years ago and it was really interesting. Uh, but back then they didn't really know that much about disease. And so the doctors back then would put on these crazy 
uh, costumes and these uh, like goggles and they would cover their face and they wore these weird masks that kind of looked like a beak. Uh, but the doctors back then, they thought that they were preventing disease by putting on those masks and they would, at the end of the mask, there would be some sort of aromatic incense or something that they thought would prevent, uh, prevent them from inhaling uh, the disease. But now, of course, we know that that doesn't work. <laughs> um, so science has come a long way. Uh, but that's domain bacteria. Uh, we learned earlier with the archaea bacteria that they're separated or categorized based upon the environment that they live in. However, with uh, U bacteria, we can often categorize them by their shape. So you can see some common shapes of bacteria. Uh, some simple ones that you guys are probably familiar with would be streptococcus. So if you guys ever heard of strep throat, or if you guys have heard about E. coli, those are other examples of uh, bacteria. Here's a quick little review chart to show you guys the difference between archaea and bacteria. So remember, these guys are both prokaryotes. They're going to be the only two prokaryotes that you learn about in today's um, virtual lesson. Uh, these guys are going to be both unicellular. And it differs uh, when we start coming to the cell wall. So remember, archaea is made of lipids, and the bacteria cell wall is made of peptidoglycan. Archaea lives in the extreme, weird, harsh conditions. And then bacteria, they are super diverse, and they can live pretty much anywhere and everywhere, even on your body and in your body. Uh, so I have a quick challenge activity for you guys. I would like for you guys to research an example of an organism in archaea bacteria and discuss where does it live and how is it adapted for its unique environment. And then the second one is to research an example of a beneficial bacteria and then research an example of a harmful bacteria. So a lot of things that we eat like cheeses and yogurt actually are, have bacteria in them. And that's how we get those food products. So it's very interesting to see the many uses of bacteria. So I'm gonna stop my screen share. That's all I have for you guys. We're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. The student wants to des describe bacteria. Bacteria are single cell primitive organisms that form a domain of organisms diverse in size, structure, and even in their habitat. And now Ms. Schramm is gonna tell you about protease Fungi. All right, here we go. So at the end of my little section, you'll be able to compare con characteristics of uh, taxonomic groups of protists and fungi. So we are going to be talking about uh, the kingdom protista and the kingdom fungi. So I have a protist on the left and some fungi on the right. You're going to be seeing a lot of pictures. I know a lot of times people think of fungus as being kind of uh, gross and only like kind of nasty or in dark and dingy kind of moisture places, but um, fungi and protists both have a lot of benefits and there's also some cons about them, but we'll get into all of that. So today's focus questions are, what are the characteristics of protists and what are the characteristics of fungi. So once again, I got the protists on top and the fungi on the bottom. And you're probably already seeing some examples that you're familiar with. So, whoops, excuse me. So I'm going to do a quick comparison before we um, get going into each kind. So comparing um, protists and fungi, protists are mostly unicellular. So of course, that's how it sounds. They're mostly made of one cell. Then fungi is mostly multicellular. And protists are going to be um, microscopic. So you're going to need a microscope to be able to view them and really study them. Um, well, you could see them in like large collections of many, but um, to look at a single protist, you're going to need a microscope, whereas fungi are visible to the naked eye. Um, then the protists, their cell membranes vary. So it's not necessarily just a solid cell membrane. And fungi, it has chitinous membranes. So it's more of a solid um, exterior membrane. Then protists are aerobic or anaerobic. They could go either way. Fungi are aerobic. And there are three major types of protists, the protozoans, algae, and molds. So some molds we'll see are um, 
actually fungi, but there are some fungi like protists. So they're kind of like wishy-washy um, that are considered molds, like slime molds and things like that. So we'll go over that in a second. And then there are fungi, are seven phyla of fungi. All right, so protists are autotrophs and heterotrophs. So that means some of them use photosynthesis and some of them consume other organisms. And fungi is just heterotrophs. So let's get into the specifics a little bit. Here are just some pictures of protists. So you can see they come in all sorts of different shapes. You've probably seen diatoms, macroalgae, um, amoebas, and we've got uh, slime mold as well. So these are mostly unicellular organisms. There's always a few exceptions to the rule. A lot of times the like organisms that don't really fit into the other kingdoms kind of get tossed into um, protists uh, because they are so varied and there's a very huge diverse um, collection of what's considered a protist. So some uh, protists are helpful like algae. So if you've ever been to a pond where there's a lot of sitting water um, or really anywhere where the water, water is kind of calm or in the fish tanks or anything like that, um, algae is photosynthetic. So it grows on top of the water and it's a food source and a major producer in aquatic ecosystems. So there's kind of what, algae, what you would see when you're looking at it. And then on the right is if you were to use a microscope to look at the algae. And algae can be found in both marine environments and freshwater environments. And it can be kind of gross like in your fish tank or um, if you're trying to go swimming in the lake or the pond, um, but it is helpful for the organisms that live there. Um, there are also protists uh, besides just algae or more specific kinds of algae in coral reefs. And those are also a major food source for coral. So a lot of people think coral are plants, they're actually animals, and they eat and feed on um, different kinds of algae and other types of protists. So you can see, especially on the right, um, that is coralline algae, and it grows in, obviously, marine environments, but um, it's like a really, really good thing. A healthy uh, reef system will have a lot of coralline algae because like I said, the coral feeds off of that. And if you look at this picture, it kind of looks really similar to some of the mushrooms we're gonna be seeing later. Um, so they are kind of similar to fungi in a lot of ways. All right, so protists are also have some um, protists act like mushrooms, or sorry, act like mold. So they kind of act like um, fungi. So slime molds are a specific kind of protists, and they are great decomposers. So these, these are the ones that you're going to see on like fallen tree or leaves, and this is um, up close what it looks like, and then far away. All right, and then some protists can cause diseases for, whoops, Ah, I just skipped like everything. Okay, <laughs> some protists can cause diseases for animals and plants. So on the left, I've got some corn stalks that are being um, kind of attacked by different protists. So the ones that are parasitic. And then also um, malaria is spread by mosquitoes, but it's because the mosquitoes consume um, harmful protists that cause the disease and then they go and bite someone else and then spread those protists and therefore spreading the disease malaria along as they bite other people. So they are sometimes beneficial and sometimes harmful. And then we have our fungi. So fungi, a lot of these you um, may have seen before. So I have, this is the turkey tail fungi that kind of reminds me of that coralline algae that we saw earlier, how it forms those little like shelves. So I thought that was interesting, but um, we also have um, mushrooms that you can eat um, that are in the forest. There are truffle mushrooms. Um, 
they grow under the ground, but they are mushrooms. And then we have mold. So there's some oranges that were sitting out and now they are covered in that fuzzy, fuzzy mold. So just like protists, fungi can look very, very different and take a lot of different forms and characteristics. So let's keep going. So some great things about fungi are um, mushrooms. So mushrooms are a great food source. People um, often hunt for mushrooms in forests. So on the top or this picture on the right, those are morel mushrooms and people go hunting for those and they're able to sell them and use them in a lot of different kinds of food. Um, the ones on the left are kind of more common. You can find um, just kind of like the same as finding truffles. If you can find morel mushrooms, those are worth a bit more. Um, the ones on the left, there are different kinds of mushrooms that you can actually grow at home. I've noticed a lot of different stores, like including Walmart, have like those grow your own mushrooms kits. And they're actually pretty fun. I've done it um, a few times, like trying different kinds. And they're really tasty and they grow really fast. So I know it takes a long time to grow vegetables and things like that. Mushrooms grow like really, really fast. Like within a week, you'll have enough to harvest. So that's pretty fun. Um, then there's harmful fungi. I apologize for these pictures. They're kind of disgusting. So some parasitic fungi cause infections for animals and plants. So fungi can cause different fungal infections. You may have heard that before. There's bacterial infections. There's also fungal infections. So sometimes people have toe fungus or this example of ringworm or different things like that are actually caused by different uh, parasitic fungi, yeast infections, all that. So that is kind of yuck. And they can also infect plants. So this is the picture on the left is a picture of potato plants that were infected with a certain kind of fungus. I can't remember the exact name, it was kind of long, but um, that's what caused the potato famine in Ireland. Um, a while ago in history. That was a big, big, big deal, especially over in Ireland. So they can definitely harm crops by like the field load, right? So they can be pretty harmful as well. Then there are some fungi um, that are toxic or poisonous. So to the left, we have those red toadstool mushrooms. Um, they look super cute. It reminds me of Mario coat heart, but those are in fact poisonous. So if you see those in the woods, they may look cute, but they are poisonous to consume. And then on the right is a picture of black mold up close. You may have seen um, black mold before. Sometimes like if it's an older building or like a room that's really damp and doesn't get enough airflow through to dry out, maybe in like a bathroom in a basement or something like that. Um, you'll get black mold and that can be really toxic. The spores, when they get into the air and you breathe them in can be really, really toxic. So some fungi are not so lovely. Then we have lichens. So lichens are kind of, they're pretty interesting. They're kind of um, complicated only because they are a fungus living in a symbiotic relationship with algae or cyanobacterium. So they grow in tandem with algae, right? So if you were here with me today, I would take you on the post oak um, preserve and we would be looking for different types of fungi and lichen and then bringing them back and looking at them under the microscope in here. But for today, I have these um, lovely pictures and we don't have to go out in the cold. So you win some, you lose some, right? Um, and there's about 17,000 17, species of lichen worldwide. All right, so my challenge to you is to be able to give an example of an organism in the kingdom protista and give an example of an organism in the kingdom fungi. So I wanna show you a few things before I let you go. Um, over the summer, I went out with students in our summer science program and was able to collect some of these false turkey tail um, mushrooms. I showed you that picture where they're bright and beautiful. These are dried out and they've been in my display case for a while. 
But here is an example of a fungi, those um, false turkey tail mushrooms. And you can see on the back, it's got all those little holes and everything. So I wish you were here so you could see and feel the texture, but those are my little fungi. And then I also have um, some tree bark with different color lichen. So you can see that pretty gold yellow color and the kind of whitish teal as well. Sorry, I don't know if it's focusing. I feel like it's still focusing on my face, but you can kind of see it. Okay. Then I have an example of some mold. So I love gardening. It's like one of my favorite things. And we have so many okra growing here. And I was like, you know what? I want to save some seeds for next year and also for um, to grow at my house. So I saved all these different okra pots, but something happened. So here is one that was dried out and saved really nicely. You can hear the seeds inside. But look what happened to some of the other ones. They got all moldy. So these ones are probably gonna be no good. I'm not sure, I'm gonna, I'll probably try, but especially like this one, look at all that mold. That is not good. So especially compared to this one that dried out. So I must've stored them somewhere a little bit too moist and it did not work out. Same thing happened when I opened a pumpkin. I had these laying out on a paper towel and then I thought they were dry, they felt dry. I put them in the bag and now look at these pumpkin seeds. They're like disgusting, covered in mold. So I do not think those are going to get planted this year. But either way, I saved them so I could tell you. <laughs> all right, so that's all I have for you today. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I can't wait to see you next time. Thank you, Ms. Schramm. Right, we had one question. Uh, please give a simple definition and example of fungi. Okay, this is very simple. Organisms that eat organic material. An example, Ms. Uh, Tram covered it very well, the black bread mold. And now Mr. Dominguez is going to talk to us, to us about plants and animals. Hey guys, it's Mr. Dominguez, and in this portion of your virtual field trip, we will be focusing on two taxonomic groups, Animalia and Plantae. And here we have some members of the Animalia group. We have some pigs and goats. And as you might have guessed, Plantae refers to plants. And here at the center, we have a wide variety of plants. We have grasses, different shrubs, different trees. And although each member of each of the groups that we're gonna focus on today come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes and colors, they all share some defining characteristic that places them in their taxonomic group. And we're going to discuss those defining characteristics today. So let's head back inside and get started with our presentation. All right, guys, so we're back inside, and I thought it would be a good idea to show you guys some of my favorite members of the Animalia Kingdom. So as we go through these different animals, I will give you a defining characteristic that places them in this taxonomic group. So here we have some roly-polies, and they are members of the Animalia group because they are multicellular. So these little guys are made up of multiple cells, not just one cell. Roly-polies are awesome pets. I love them. They come in a wide variety of colors. And these little panda isopods uh, get their name because they are obviously the color of a panda. They are awesome. Here we have Teddy, and Teddy is one of my favorite animals we have here at the center. He is a red-foot tortoise, a reptile that is native to South America. But what makes him a member of the Animalia group? Well, besides being multicellular, Teddy is a heterotroph. What does that mean? Well, that means that he cannot produce his own food and is instead reliant on other organisms for sustenance. In fact, he is eating some members of the plantae kingdom, some of his favorite Foods include papaya, turnip greens, and squash. 
even though these guppies are incredibly small, so these are the smallest organisms that we've shown so far, they are also members of the Anomalia group, and that's because they are eukaryotes. So that means that they have cells that have nuclei and membrane-bound organelles. And unlike plant cells, these cells do not have cell walls. That's something we'll talk about in a little bit when we talk about the plantae kingdom. While the mechanisms that animals use to move varies greatly, so some are bipedal, some are quadrupeds, some crawl, some slither, the ability to move places an organism in the taxonomic group Anomalia. So here we have Mr. Gobbles and some of our chickens. All of these guys are multicellular, they are eukaryotic, have the ability to move, so they are all members of the group Anomalia. So now that we know a few of the characteristics that place organisms in the animal kingdom, let's talk about the plant kingdom. And the first thing that I noticed as a kid about plants is that they're all green. So why are they green? Well, members of the plant kingdom have a very special pigment called chlorophyll. And chlorophyll helps with the absorption of light. And that is crucial to the next characteristic that we are going to talk about. Another amazing characteristic of the members of the plant kingdom is that they can produce their own food through the process of photosynthesis. So they use that big bright yellow star in the sun to make their own food. So unlike the heterotrophs in the animal kingdom, plants are considered autotrophs. That means that they can produce their own food. And that's why we call them producers. And we know that producers are vital to us heterotrophs. We use them as food. So this little goat was just munching on some grass, and that grass was producing its own food through photosynthesis. Um, and lucky for these goats and these animals, we have organisms that are not reliant on anything but the sun to produce their own food. All right, guys, so I'm back inside my classroom with a wonderful model of a plant cell. And members of the plant kingdom are also eukaryotic, which means that they have cells with a nucleus and they have all these wonderful membrane-bound organelles. However, plant cells have cell walls. So this is a difference between the cells of a member of the plant kingdom and a member of the animal kingdom. So cell walls, are one of the distinguishing characteristics that members of the plant kingdom have. Pretty cool. And the last plantae characteristic that we are going to talk about today is a plant's inability to move. So unlike animals who have the ability to move, plants do not. So here's my desert rose, and I made a pretty big mistake by leaving it out during the cold uh, winter days that we had not too long ago. Uh, and since this plant is native to the Saharan Desert, it doesn't do so well in cold temperatures. And I'm sure that if it had the ability to move inside, it would have done so. But I'm trying to save it. Let's hope I can. Well, guys, hope you guys have a wonderful day. Until next time. Question. Uh, what is a couple more differences between plants and animals? Okay. Uh, plants cannot move from one place to the other. And that we just covered for the question came in. And Plants have both living and non-living cells. And animals can move, as you know, and animals only have living cells. Now I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students recognize the importance of a standardized taxonomic system for the scientific community, learn to categorize organisms using a hierarchical classification system based on similarities and differences shared among groups and compared characteristics of taxonomic groups. Mr. Monroe introduced you to taxonomy. Mr. Maris covered archaea and bacteria. Ms. Schramm, protease and fungi, and plants and animals by Mr. Dominguez. Thank you very much, teachers and students, for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed it. Most of all, we hope you learned something. Teachers, if you would, go to www.tiny.cc slash HS feedback, send us a short form back so we'll know what you think of it. We appreciate again you joining us. You guys have a great rest of the beautiful day 
and a great rest of your life.